I am so excited to be able to talk with Kristen and bring a much needed awareness. And I'm like in my mind figuring out what are the things, how do we, we know a lot of people, we've helped a lot of people. And we, we know that there's been a lot of intended parents who come to surrogacy after a lot of loss. And so for me, I'm thinking, how the heck do we get in front of these people's face who can potentially donate and we can spread the word and, and help others in this really much needed space that is I feel is like just a void right now so it is uh, it is um I think yeah I, I think this is such surrogacy is a beautiful thing about building families and something that you don't anticipate when you enter into a surrogacy arrangement is the possibility that that the pregnancy outcome can be tragic like it was in the journey that led up to surrogacy. So I'm so grateful that Kristen has channeled her suffering and her loss into a way to help other people. So I am so honored to be able to share her story today and to meet her. And I'm so grateful that she's willing to share and that she's so open um, because it it is a story that happens to a lot of people, but most people keep to themselves because they don't know how to share or don't feel comfortable sharing. And um, so I'm really grateful and excited to have her here. And we will uh, yeah. have her on our podcast is a small, tiny step. And we'll figure out other ways to get get the message out there too. But London is the Reason is a beautiful organization I first heard about, um, I think, maybe a year and a half ago um, when... I can't, I can't remember how I got one of her packets in front of me of information about London is the reason and reading her letter. And, um, I'm just really honored that she's going to join us today and share her story with our listeners that can benefit from hearing her heart and, uh, what an incredible human being she is. Yeah. Let's do this. Hi. (sighs) Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Oh, gosh. Kristen McQuaid, I'm so excited to have you. Um, Surrogacy is a podcast. You are somebody that we have been following your journey and just been aware of. And um, just so grateful that you are here and willing to share what you've been through and, and help other people, other families, other women who have experienced something similar. And um or maybe who who haven't, but maybe will. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, well, I'm thanks very, for having me. Very excited. I'm so to have excited you. to talk to you, girls. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I think um, Sunshine and I have been experienced surrogates. I did my first journey. Um, he's actually going to be 16 on the 30th of this month, which oh is crazy God. to me. Um, but we have I've fallen in love with this because what. What I got to experience seeing my parents hold their baby for the first time was that unreal feeling that I know we all, that's the thing, right? And so, but I've seen and I've worked in this industry a long time and I was a case manager for years and it doesn't always go that way. And there hasn't been a resource that can lean in and just be that hug that we need and saying it's okay. So I just am super grateful that you are here and able to kind of talk to your story and then be this platform, this voice and um, lend in is beautiful. So thank you. Just been doing thank that. you. I think so too. <laughs> she's a, she's a beautiful little girl with um, a mission that I can't wait to share with everyone. So I can know you share, I guess, an introduction. Yeah. Tell us Absolutely. about yourself and your yeah. fertility journey and yeah, so just a little bit of a backstory about myself. I grew up in the dance world um, and I moved to Southern California and was in film and television. One of my first shows was Days of Our Lives and I danced with Britney Spears and Prince and I did all the all the Hollywood things, I guess you could say. And um, when my family was moving all about, so we landed one of our places was Houston, Texas. And um, one of my best friends there was getting married. And I went to the wedding and I met my husband. He told me he was from Oklahoma. And I looked at him and was like, 
I don't know where that is. <laughs> and he was like, are you kidding me? And I was like, no, I've honestly never heard of that state before. I mean, I had heard about it, but like, where is it? I have no idea. So he was like, it's above Texas. And I was like, oh, okay. So like cows roam around and he's like, no, it's like a normal city. No, 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 guys. It's not a normal city. <laughs> I mean, we have two malls, actually one now, but it's nothing like California. So I told him, I am not moving there. I, I can't. Like, this is where California is where I'm at. So we did long distance for four years. Wow. And then the industry kind of took a like a little shift. Um, and so I decided if I was to leave right now, would I have felt like I accomplished what I wanted to do? And from in front of the camera, yes, I did. And so I moved on to like producing and directing, um, but I could do that from anywhere. So I decided to make the leap and move to Oklahoma and then still travel back to California when need be. So my husband and I uh, were married um, shortly after I moved here. And we are, we've been married for 16 years, um, to date. So that's fantastic. Oh, congratulations. My husband and I just celebrated our 16 year anniversary on the oh, 19th too. Doesn't it feel like 49 years? It's <laughs> just so many lifetimes. So many. I mean, it's crazy. And at the same time, you're like, but I just feel like it was just not that long ago that we got married, but that also feels like so long. Time is not real. <laughs> it's, it definitely is not. And time in any journey, surrogacy, everything is the most horrible word. I hate I the word time. Uh. So um, we w wanted to just kind of like be us because we never got to celebrate us without being long distance for so long. So we waited a couple years and then we decided it was time to grow our family. And just like anyone, you just think you're just going to have sex and you're just going to have a baby. And that just, that wasn't happening for us, but I thought like this totally fine, like totally normal this happens all the time. So I was like, Kristen, you're overthinking it. Just calm down, do some meditation. It's going to be fine. So a couple of years still go by and I'm like, okay, maybe we need some, some help. So we went to the doctor and I um, had endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is totally fine because Chloe Kardashian also has endometriosis. And if she can have a baby, I can have a baby because Kristen is a Kardashian fan. So I thought, this is fine. Like we're gonna we're gonna get through this. And so the 20 minute surgery that was supposed to be in and out will clean you out ended up being an hour and 45 minute surgery mm. where I had to spend the night in the hospital. The doctor came out and said that was the worst case of endometriosis he had ever seen. Mm. And still I didn't feel defeated. I thought, well, if we're gonna get pregnant, it's gonna be now because we're cleaned out. Now it's gonna be go time. And it still wasn't happening. Um, a couple years had gone by and I had to have another clean out because the endometriosis had come back. The pain was just unreal. Those of you that- That's what I was going to ask you because you found out you had endometriosis. I wondered if you, did you have a lot of pain? Were you aware? If you had the worst that had ever been seen, I guess you just don't know because it's your body. You're like, this is normal because it's normal you for know, you. You know, when I first started noticing is when we were having sex and mm. it felt like needles and knives. And I felt so embarrassed to tell my husband that it was so painful yeah, because, and it also was like, I wanted a baby so bad and I didn't want to like embarrass my husband. And it was like a kind of a mixed emotion kind of feeling. Um, so I knew something was not right, but I also wasn't thinking, I didn't even know what endometriosis was um, until I had gone to the doctor um, because it's all internal and you don't really even know. A lot of people live with endometriosis and don't even know they have it. Yep. Um, and so then once I knew what that pain was, then I knew when it was coming back. Um, and so I had gone in for another clean out and the doctor said, Kristen, this 
you have been cleaned out twice. You are going to have a baby, like you, maybe multiples at this point. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, that's fine. We can have, give me four babies. We can do it. <laughs> We've been waiting for so long. We can have babies, lots of them. And so um, we had, we finally got pregnant. And I remember like being so nervous, like peeing on the little stick and like my heart's just like fluttering and racing. I just, that's just the best feeling for any woman just to be like, ah. Um, and so I remember going in, my husband is a cardiologist. And so I remember going to the hospital and running down the hall. I wanted it to be like one of those movie scenes where it's like slow motion running, like, honey, look, and like jumping into his arms. It wasn't quite like that, but kind of. And so um, we got to our first appointment and the nurse said, well, there's no heartbeat yet, but it could be too early. Don't we just love that? It could be too early. So then we go upstairs and the doctor was like, you're, you're going to have a miscarriage. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, wow. Just like that. That's how you're going to tell me. Okay, great. Um, so now what? Because I had never gone through this. Like, what's the pain? What am I supposed to experience? Like, I'm freaking out. Um, when is this going to happen? I don't know. Um, and it was awful as everyone has, you know, anyone that has gone through a miscarriage can know that it's awful. Um, so there was a positive and a negative. We had just lost a baby. Uh, but the positive was that I got pregnant and I'm thinking, this is great. Like I can get pregnant. So we kept trying again and we had no luck, no luck. And the endometriosis came back again, but it came back even worse. And I finally went to the doctor and he said, Kristen, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to have to have a hysterectomy. Like you, your endometriosis is, it's not going to cure itself. Like it's just going to keep coming back. And I think that it's interfering with your infertility. And so I swallowed that as any woman that has gone and been told that they have to have a hysterectomy. I think I was in my late twenties. Um, and I was thinking like, wow, like they're, I can never hold a baby myself. Like that's just taken away from me. And there was no outlet for me. Like, okay, so this is what you're going to do next. And if you want a child, you can do this. Like, obviously I had known about adoption because of Annie and like all of these movies that we all grew up with. And so I knew that that was obviously an option. Um, And I had always wanted to adopt ever since I was a little girl. So maybe I was just like, cut out to never carry a child. Um, but I, I thought like, okay, well, let me just do some research. And I came across surrogacy and I thought, you know what, let's do this first because this is going to be our closest option to pregnancy where I can be involved in all of the, you know, the doc, the doctor appointments and, the ultrasounds and having talking to the surrogate and saying like the baby's starting to kick and I can hear the hiccups and, and I wanted to be a part of all of that. And so we went through a surrogacy agency in Texas and the journey was perfect. Like it was textbook. I, I flew to, I think two or three appointments. I went, the big one was the anatomy scan And I, I felt like it wasn't long enough. Like I was expecting to be there for like two or three hours. And I just wanted to stare at the, at the little baby. Her name is London. And I just wanted to stare at her and watch her kick and move and twirl around and get away from the little prong that they're poking (laughs) the surrogate's belly with. And, um, she was just adorable. And I didn't want that moment to end. And little did I know that that moment was going to be mo- what I was going to see her move at all. Mm-hmm. And so um, 
we went, my husband and I uh, quickly realized that we had no idea what we were doing. We were about to welcome this baby girl into our home and this the surrogate had a, a planned c-section because she had c-sections with her other two kids and so we had a, a due date so we were driving down to texas listening to podcast after podcast after podcast what do you do with a newborn baby like we had no idea like what do we just set her down when we come inside we don't really know and and guys we had everything for the baby i mean I watched hours and hours and hours of like, what products are the best? What swing is the best? And, you know, everybody has their own opinion. Well, I didn't want to be wrong. You know, they say the baby might like this, but my baby hated it. So, but my baby liked this one. We bought them all. We had them all. We had rooms full, everything. I had the cleaners in. I had, it was immaculate to welcome in baby London. And we had done the name reveal and the gender reveal and it, and I'm a very, I'm a public persona. And so I, everything in my life has been public. And so the world was like ready to welcome in baby London too with me. And we drove down to Dallas and um, we were meeting with our surrogate the night before and we had dinner. Her, her family had cooked us dinner. We exchanged gifts. And I was thinking like, this is the last time that I'm going to go to sleep without being a mom. Like this is it. So it was, it was crazy. And, and then we, then we take a turn. Yeah. So that's me in a nutshell. I mean, I can keep going. Yeah, I think um, those are the moments, you know, we don't, it's, it's like you don't even have words. Um, I would love it if you would. If you, I, if I, um, I love that up until that moment that you still are celebrating all of those moments because they are special in all of those moments, even when London was in utero she was loved and having yeah. the best life and the best yeah. family to come home to and life is so unfair and some people get long lives and some people get short lives and there's just no justice in it but it's awesome that yeah. she that she existed for the time that she did so thank you for sharing yeah you know I do joy. think that that's important to realize like you kind of create a world for your child before they're even here. Like I knew that she was going to be like a little rocker girl and I wanted her to do gymnastics. And I mean, I had Alf, you just have this whole world picked out for them and um, you envision like what you're going to do and what conversations you're going to have. And your your whole world is surrounded by this human that isn't even here yet and um so the next morning i woke up and in the nine months that london was with the surrogate and I had gone to appointments. I had never asked any medical questions. There were never any reasons for me to ask any medical questions. Every doctor's appointment, when the surrogate would call me and said, everything looks great, no complications, everything. I just went in, listened to the heartbeat and everything's fine. So I never really had a reason um, to doubt that anything was wrong. I woke up, we, we had to be at the hospital. This was during COVID. So the surrogate had to go early to go get COVID tested and this and that. So we were gonna meet her a little bit later, um, but still it was very early. Um, and so I had woke up around 4.30 in the morning and I immediately texted my surrogate and said, have they hooked London up to the heart monitor yet? And she was like, no, they haven't. They're still doing the test and this and that. I was like, okay, well, text me when they do. I don't know what came over me to ask this odd question about her heart. 
Um, and I had gone over to just put like a cold washcloth on my face. And I was like, devil, if this is you coming to steal my joy after waiting for 14 years of infertility and surgery, surgery, loss, lo like I need you to flee because you, this is my moment to celebrate our daughter. And there was just something so heavy about like this feeling that I was holding. And my, I my parents had flown in. So I got everybody, the grandma, grandpa, mom, dad shirts. And my, uh, my husband had his shirt on and I didn't have mine on. And he said, are you, are we not wearing our shirts today? And I was like, oh, cause I didn't want to tell him what I was feeling. Cause I didn't, I, I was hoping I was wrong. I was hoping that like this feeling was just abnormal and I didn't really know. Uh, so I said, oh, well, I think maybe let's, let's just wait until after skin to skin because I want to walk around the hospital and be so proud with my mom's shirt on with baby London. And um, he was like, just put it on, Kristen. And I was like, okay, I'll put it on. So the communications with the surrogate had started to slow down a little bit. And I knew that she was being hooked up and all that stuff. So I didn't want to bother her too much. Um, we got into the hospital and we rang the bell and I said, hi, this is Kristen and Steve and we're here. My surrogate's here. We're going to be delivering our little baby girl today. And they were like, okay, a nurse is going to be here. Um, she'll come out to get you. Just have a seat in the lobby. Okay. Normal. I don't know. I've never been through this before. So I just thought like, okay. Um, shortly after, a few minutes after the nurse had come back and said, Kristen and Steve, and my parents had stood up and they, the nurse said, oh, why don't you guys wait here? And I was like, okay, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe it's rules. Maybe it's COVID. I don't know. So we go back and we're led to this room and it's like a testing room, almost like where you would give blood or there was no bed in it. There, my surrogate wasn't in there. I just thought like, okay, Kristen, like maybe your thoughts really are real. And so we sat down, they said, the doctor will come in in just a second. And I was like, why is the doctor coming into this room? And shortly after she came in with a nurse on either side of her and she looked at us and she said, it's not good. She doesn't have a heartbeat. I froze and I just dropped my head. It was almost like I couldn't breathe. But in a very weird sense, my heart had already prepared myself for this news. My husband, on the other hand, was not prepared at all. He was pacing the room, asking, what do you mean? You just saw her two days ago and she was completely fine. What are you, what is the, no, this can't be real. This can't be right. And she was like, I know, I, I don't know. And my immediate thought was, I want to go home. I, I don't like what is happening? Is this, am I awake? I know it's early. Like so many thoughts were going through my mind. And then I, I thought out of all of the people in the world, how can this be happening to me? Like people pop out babies left and right. There are families that have like over 12 babies and they have no issues at all. And they're just, they treat pregnancy like it's just a walk in the park. And after 14 years of waiting, I was minutes away from being a mom. And then that moment was stripped away and there were no answers. One thing that I wanted to make sure for myself, and I told my surrogate this from the very beginning is I'm not leaving the hospital until you leave the hospital. And I said, you have given me a life and I want to make sure your life is okay. And as I selfishly 
took that moment away that I just wanted to escape and run away from this. I had to remember that my surrogate still had to go and have a C-section. And so we stayed at the hospital and we had social workers and doctors and so many people coming out and talking to us. And you could tell it was just, it was the saddest day for everyone. The doctor was in tears. The doctor and I still talk to this day and she has been so affected by the loss of London. And there was just something special about London's presence where, and it's just, just so hard for me to say because any child that is lost is a precious child. But London has affected so many doctors and nurses where they have changed their lives because of London. And that to me just in itself is unbelievable. And I remember a, a nurse came out, out to me, we were sitting by the fountains outside. And as we were waiting for the surrogate to get cleared after the C-section and she said, oh, I just remember this so clearly, it's awful. She said, um, London, we have London out and we have her all dressed and she's beautiful and she's perfect. And I wanted to punch her because she wasn't perfect because she wasn't breathing. She wasn't alive. I didn't have her. And now I understand what she was saying, but in the moment, I, I didn't even know I could see London. I didn't even know that that was an option. No one had prepared me for, if your baby is born sleeping, this is what's going to happen. And I, I didn't, I wasn't prepared. My heart wasn't prepared for that. And they said, she's all ready for you. You can come see her. I was like, I can't, I can't see her. I can't because a, I, I don't think I can like emotionally and B I don't, will never want to leave her. Like I just would want to hold on to her forever and ever and ever. And so I said, told Steve, I can't do it. I, I can't, you know, and social workers were coming up saying, Kristen, for your grieving, you really should go see her. And I, I kept telling him, I can't, I, I just can't. I, I couldn't even, I could barely breathe, let alone like think of going to see what I could have had. And Steve said, and this must have been hours, maybe like, two or three hours after, um, maybe not even that long. The time that day was just so often. Um, Steve said, I'm gonna go, I have to go see her for, for myself, but I respect if you don't wanna see her. And I kept hearing a voice in the back of my head saying, get up, get up and go see her. And I, I kept saying like, I can't, I can't. And this voice, like, I just kept hearing it, like, get up. And I remember my, my legs were so numb. I remember like walking into the hospital, my legs were so heavy. And I, I felt like I wasn't even inside my body. And we turned the corner and there was a little white rose on the door. And I thought, that's where she is. That has to be her room. And sure enough, it was. And um, they opened up the door and there was doctors and nurses flooding the room. And I couldn't see London yet. And I could hear one of the doctors say, they're here, they're here. And 
it almost was like everybody separated and I could see her. And she was so beautiful. She was stunning. And I just remember that feeling that I had, that really heavy feeling was gone. I felt so airy and light. It was like a piece that I didn't think was going to be there. And I walked over to her and she was still warm. She was pink. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I'm just waiting for her to breathe. She said, I know. And she was just laying there so peacefully. And I knew that she was in a better place. And I knew she, I just knew that she didn't, wasn't struggling. If she was, I don't know. And the doctor told me, you can pick her up. And I thought, oh my gosh, I get to hold her. And it was the, I had never held a baby that was mine before. And so I held her and I, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. And I, I turned to my husband and I said, I want to have 20 babies now because <laughs> she was so pretty. Because we were going to be one and done with London. And I just, all the doctors and nurses had cleared out of the room. And I just remember looking at her and just thinking, there's something about you that is not making me feel so empty. Like you're trying to tell me something. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And I finally, um, I finally let her go after, I think it was like six hours. And I just was cuddling with her and sleeping with her. And um, I would re-swaddle her up and acting like I was a little girl, like with a little baby doll. And um, I finally let her go and I was given this bear and it was like a Build-A-Bear and it was a nurse brought it in and it had a little tag on it. And it said, um, I wanna give you this bear so you don't leave the hospital empty handed. And it said, our daughter was stillborn and we left empty handed and I don't want you to feel the same. And it was in that moment that I thought someone else can feel what I'm feeling. Someone else knows exactly the way I feel. And I didn't feel so alone anymore. We ended up staying in the hospital that night because I was staying true to myself and said, I'm not leaving until my surrogate leaves. And so my parents had gone back to the hotel room and uh, we stayed in the hospital. They, they put us in a different floor so we wouldn't be hearing babies cry. And um, they kept bringing in like little memorabilia of London and it just would bring a whole new wave again. They had her dressed in this beautiful white dress and the hospital does such a great job at when babies pass, they take old wedding dresses and they have uh, volunteers that make them into little angel dresses. And so she was dressed in this most, the most beautiful dress. And to think of that bride that donated her dress so that London could look so beautiful when she went to heaven is just like that woman will never know what she did. And um, I selfishly kept, um, I wanted to keep her in her dress when I sent her away. Um, but I selfishly kept her blanket that she was wrapped in. And so her color is always lavender. Um, that's just the, the color that they chose for her. And um, 
I sleep with that blanket and that bear every night. And um, uh, the hospital blanket that she was wrapped in, I, I sleep with that every night. And um, we left the hospital. And I didn't know what to do next. I, I just wanted a baby so bad. I remember being in shock that day, hours after finding out that London didn't make it. And I asked the doctor, I said, are there any babies here that don't have a mom and dad? Because if, if not, I, I'll take the baby. And obviously that's that shock speaking and it's obviously not how it works. And, but your heart is just hurting so bad that you just want to fill that void. And, um, I got home and I was in a coma for four days. I didn't eat. I didn't drink. I didn't. I, I couldn't function at all. And all I wanted to do was talk to my surrogate. I didn't, I didn't turn my phone on or look at my phone. The second that I found out that London didn't make it for three weeks after London passed, because I, I knew I was going to have text messages saying, you must be in mom world. You must be so over the moon that you haven't shared with us about London or we're so sorry what happened. And I, either way, I didn't, I couldn't face that yet. I emotionally just wasn't there. I felt like, I felt so embarrassed. I felt like I had left, let the whole world down. I, everyone was so excited to welcome in baby London. And I was so embarrassed. And I don't know why I felt embarrassed, but that's just the feeling that came over me that I let everyone down. And um, my sister had come in. Uh, she drove 24 hours straight from Las Vegas to our house and moved every baby item away and hid it so that when I walked in, I wasn't reminded of the baby wonderland that we had created for London. And um, I started looking up support groups. We, my husband and I uh, attended a support group just four days after we came home. And I remember not wanting to talk at all when I first went to that meeting. And I just wanted to listen. And I almost was just mad. Like, why am I here? I shouldn't be here. I should be giving my baby a bottle and hearing her scream and cry. But then I realized, like, I almost wasn't, um, what's the word? Like, I, I just wasn't emotionally attached to the things that were being said and to how to heal me because I didn't carry the child. I had no physical or emotional, I had emotional, but no physical attachment to London. I had no milk in my breast. I wasn't having hormones that were in my body and now trying to escape. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't have anything. So although I was London's, although I am London's mom, I never held a piece of London, you know? And so when I would go to these meetings or pick up a book on infant loss, I would find myself like skipping through 75% of the book because none of it applied to me. And it would be like, you know, talking about, you know, how to move on from, you still feel the kicks and you still feel those little flutters in your stomach. And I would be, it would almost take me back to that moment when they were like, you're going to have to have a hysterectomy. And it was just so many emotions that were just stacking up on top of each other. I already knew I couldn't carry a child, but it almost was like rubbing it in my face that not only did you lose a child, but you also can't carry a child. So none of this applies to you. So I started looking up loss for surrogacy and I thought there has to be uh, an outlet for surrogates because 
there's a million for infant loss. And I couldn't find any. And I started reaching out to the surrogacy agency and they were like, actually, I don't think there is any. And I am a huge fan of Shark Tank. And I think I'm going to be a multimillionaire one day by inventing something. However, every time I think of something, I then go on to Google and it's already invented. So really, I'm like, oh, so I'm thinking it's one of those situations where I'm like, okay, this isn't like something that doesn't really exist, right? Because there's billions of people on this earth. You can't tell me that this is that in that moment, right then, two weeks after London passed, I knew that was London's purpose in life. I knew right then that's why I felt that peace when I saw her because she didn't even need to live here on this earth for her purpose to be heard. She just needed me to see her and to know that that was her purpose was to create a, a mission and an outlet for those that follow her and such a brave soul to give her life to help others. And that in that moment is when London is the reason is born. Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. My, my, I joke because my husband, <laughs> he was in the garage and he just to get his grief and rage and all of that out, he was building up his gym. <laughs> And he wanted to show me this, cre like, I don't even know what it's called, like something on the wall. And he was like, Kristen, come, do you want to see what I've been doing? And I was like, sure. <laughs> so I go out and he, he, I, he shows me and he's like, what have you been doing? And I was like, oh, let me show you. I created a whole website and I started a nonprofit organization for London. And he was like, okay. I shouldn't have shown you what I just did. In the <laughs> Let's just keep it at you created. Please this don't tell people about my gym. <laughs> gym. Yeah. And I just, that was just such a funny, like timing thing that he was like, so what have you been doing? Um, and it was, I, another crazy kind of link to London is the reason is uh, the name. And I remember when London was still um, in the surrogate's belly, I wanted a shirt when she was born to wear it, actually even before, because I, I, everyone knew that I was going to name her London. And I wanted a shirt that said London, but I didn't want it to be cheesy, you know, like, uh, London. Um, so like, I don't know. I, I had it in mind, but I just didn't, wasn't really specific. So I went on Etsy. I, I'm an Etsy girl. I love Etsy. <laughs> Um, don't get me started on there because then I won't even leave and ooh, they can take my money. And so I went on there and I, I came across this shirt and it said, it has the coolest text and it said, London is the reason. And I thought, well, I, I like it. I have no idea what it means, but I'm going to buy it. And so I bought it and I was thinking, Okay, Kristen, almost like a tattoo, you need to be prepared for when people say, what does that mean? And every time I wear it, and I'm going to send both of you yes. girls a lot oh of reason gosh, question. Please. Every time I wear it, people are like, London is the reason. And I go, she sure is. Let me tell you. And um, I remember coming home from the hospital and looking in my closet for a sweatshirt. And I was moving my clothes and I came across the London as the reason. And I just fell to the floor and I was like, wow, wait a minute. Like it's all making sense. So I messaged the seller from the sweatshirt and I was like, you have no idea. Like, I don't know why you made the sweatshirt, but this is what it is now. And he was like, I'm in tears reading this. He's like, I had no idea that like 
this sweatshirt that I made would become such a phenomenon and like helping others. And so it was just everything almost just seemed like easy in a sense where it just was like laid out. Like I barely had to think like, oh, I'm going to start a nonprofit for my daughter. I, it just happened. And it's, I think it's just because she was guiding me to know that that's what was supposed to be. And it has been a huge success. Three years, going on three years. London just turned three on July 14th. Mm. And um, she saved, I know of, two lives of women that have wanted to take their lives because they didn't think they could live on with the pain of their loss. And hearing London's story changed their outlet. Not only did one become a surrogate again, one is now a advisor to help other surrogates along their journey. So they flipped it into a positive and are now helping others because of London's purpose and mission. It blows my mind. Like everyone thanks me and I'm like, oh no, it's not me, it's London. I am just speaking her voice and being her mission. Um, and obviously I know like I'm her mom and it's hard to come from such a dark place. Like, and I want everyone to know that I was in a very, very dark place when London passed. Um, points of me not wanting to be alive. I didn't think, I didn't have anything to live for other than my husband and my family. I had no other, I didn't have children. So I thought, why? I just want to be with London. I wanted to be with her so bad that I knew that, that was my only way to do it. And then I thought, Kristen, you can't. And so to think of going here to where we are today is mind-blowing just for me honestly i i want to ask about your surrogates experience because that's a really i i imagine she probably carried a lot of self-blame and things like that Wait, were you able to talk with her afterwards and how did she cope with it you know this was her first uh journey uh being a surrogate and so this was our first journey together. So we were both very eager and all in, and it was a first experience for us both. Um, so she was just as involved, I, I guess, as I was. And she, you know, it's hard because I know for myself, I don't think I could ever be a surrogate just because of the emotional attachment. Um, women that are surrogates. Oh my goodness, Casey. Warriors. You guys are so selfless to, to give someone a chance like myself that could never be a mom. That role, that title is something that no, even a surrogate can't understand. And so I think that there was a sense of emotional attachment to London because she was such a powerhouse and she, she changed the role of so many, just even in the hospital, that it was hard for my surrogate. She knew that she wasn't going to walk away with a baby in the beginning but she still walked away with a piece of London and had to explain to her kids where the baby is. And I think her kids at the time were like two and four. So not only, cause she knew like, they were they knew that she was having a baby and they wanted to see the baby and they she had explained to them so that was hard um and then also i just think that 
I only wanted to talk to my surrogate after the loss of London. I didn't want to talk to anyone else. And I think that was because, and I think she felt the same way. And I think it's because we still felt like London was a part of us. And when I was texting her, I felt like I was texting London in a very weird way. So my husband got me a burner phone, as he would say, um, because I wouldn't turn on my other phone. And so, and of course he didn't get me one that I could text easy. It was like the one where you have to, like, if you want the letter C, you have the to go one, one, one. <laughs> I'm like, honey, I'm already struggling. Can you get me a phone that like, I don't have to think about, oh my gosh, it was so hard. And we made it work. So my texts were very short, but they, they were there. And so I just remember laying in bed and we both were just like texting each other back and forth. And so she felt the, the loss and the letdown and the grieving. And I felt for her, I ruined her life. She's going to have to deal with death for the rest of her life. Her kids are going to like always talk about London and what happened. And she's, I feel like she's always going to carry on this story with in her life where she never felt like she accomplished what she was out to do. And so I felt personally that I was, that I ruined her life, that London was gone. So like my grieving was for so many people, not just my family and myself and my husband, but I had to think about like my surrogate and her family and her parents and all of her friends. And it was, I felt like I was spreading myself so thin in trying to heal myself because I had that added layer of loss. And I know that my surrogate felt the same way. I know that she felt like, how am I going to, I don't want to go to work and people be like, how's the baby? Like, how was she? Which let's see pictures. And I felt so bad that she had to go through that. I, I selfishly thought like, just because I wanted a child, I put this human through this pain. Like, how could I do that? And again, like, I could have, what if I chose another surrogate? Would this have happened? And like all these thoughts go through your brain. And I just, I, I feel, I feel for her. I really do. How about now? What resources, I guess I would love because we could go on and talking about all the elements of your story forever. But what I'd really love for yeah. our listeners to be able to take away is what does London is the reason offer as support so that somebody else who God forbid ever finds themselves in this situation, what do they do first? What can they expect um, as resources yeah. from, from London is the reason. Okay. So London is the reason offers free support, not only through support groups, but also with surrogates and intended parents. So each party can discuss with another surrogate or with another intended parent who has gone through loss and get the resources emotionally that they need. I felt like when I went through loss, I was led to a therapist that didn't go through loss and I got nothing out of that. Not to diss any therapist because therapy may work for you. It just didn't work for me. And others that I have talked to that have gone through loss have also felt like talking to other parents that have gone through loss or other surrogates, that is when their healing started to begin. And so with London is the reason that has a resource for those people to be able to be reached out to. We can do text messages, we can do Zoom calls, we can do group therapy. So you may want to talk to a group of surrogates and say, what happened to you here? What happened to you here? How did you deal with this? Because everybody has a different answer and that answer might just be what you need to hear. And then as far as you can talk to me always, you can always reach out to me free 
no charge, call me, text me. You may get to the point where you're like, okay, it's my time, but I'm not ready. Because you may feel ready right now, but you may get to that point right before your time and say, I can't do it. I can't do it. And that's okay because I get you. Like, I get it. And so that is always there. We are an open book. The, the nonprofit is, is here for, for you and for support. And then we also offer healing boxes where I can get these boxes to you whether you just lost a baby or maybe it's been a few months and you're like, I haven't been able to find my healing yet. Like, I don't even know where to really begin. Let me send you a box. Let me help you get to where you need to begin to start your healing. And these boxes are specific for surrogates and for intended parents. So they're different for each party because you guys are going through different healing processes. And so the nonprofit is, is just a free resource that is much needed all across the board in agencies, in hospitals. If you have a way of getting these boxes to a local hospital that you want me to send them to, reach out to me. I will send them to your hospital. If you have a a doula or a therapist that you are like, this therapist talks to a lot of intended parents and infant loss, have them reach out to me. And I would be more than happy to send these boxes to them. So the nonprofit offers a lot of endless support and we are always here for you. I am. Um, something you had said when I was watching another podcast um, that you had shared this story was there was healing when you got to see her. And um, when I was a case manager years ago, um, I was a case manager for a journey um, where the surrogate um, had to deliver a stillborn baby at 24 weeks. And um, the parents were so devastated and heartbroken, they couldn't come to the hospital to say goodbye to their baby. And um, I didn't want her to be by herself. So I was right by her side when she delivered and she um, grieved and it was hard. And I watched her and, and she stayed in that room similar to what you had shared as long as I would let her. And I then connected with the intended parents afterwards and they had so much grief wishing they had done it differently, that they had come and held their baby girl And um, so I just, I think that this resource is so necessary and I want, I want you to touch every single agency out there in the sense that like, I want to scream through the rooftops because it's not common, but it does happen and and it happens every day. And I want there to be a resource so that parents and surrogates alike have this tool that they can feel like I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And it is hard, but this is how you can get to the other side of it, you know? So I'm so grateful for, for London and what you are doing in her. It just, yeah, we're, we have an agency. Um, I've been doing this 16 years. Sunshine's a three-time surrogate. I'm a two-time surrogate. We're really grossly um, in love with surrogacy and everything it stands for. And, um, the hope and the joy and the beauty that it brings, but there is some sadness in that. And I just am grateful that there is a resource now tangible for us to give in, in a situation that is needed. So I just, I thank you. Thank you for being a part of this with us today. And thank you for sharing. Of course. Yeah. I think that um, if I can just touch on, on what you were saying, as far as, um, from an agency standpoint, um, my goal for London is the reason to, is to get boxes in every single agency so that in the case that this does happen, they have them on hand and can either bring them to the hospital or you have them to send them off. Um, my agency, when we went through London, had never gone through a full term stillbirth situation. Um, And they didn't know how to proceed. They didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to send. They didn't know 
what to do next. And I think that that is what London is the reason is for, is to turn to say, we have a resource from the very beginning of the journey. I think it is very important for agencies and for clients like myself as the intended parent to be very, very open about what can happen. Because I do feel it's in the contract. It is stated that this is not a guarantee, but it's almost like you just, you almost feel like you're buying something, you know, like you're going to sign a contract, you're giving your money, it's, and then this is the product that you're going to get. But we forget that it's life, that you're dealing with humans, that you're dealing with science, and it's not always going to come to fruition. And I feel like with surrogacy, everyone feels like it's a guarantee. And I think I heard that in one ear and out the other. And I thought, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, right, right. And I just was so eager to get my child that I didn't hear it. And I wish I would have because I, I wish I would have said, okay, but there's also a, a chance that something could happen, but I'm in good hands because if this does, the support that I have for it is going to help me to start again mm. or to go in a different direction to be able to have a child in a different way, to know that it, that just wasn't the end. And that's what I felt. I felt like once I lost London, that was it. It was blackout done. And it was up to me to figure out what was next. And it, it life has, London has given us two babies here on earth. And so today, seven months after London had passed, we, we looked into adoption after London passed. I think it was like four months after. Um, which is very early. I, you have to go through all these like psychological tests and all of this stuff. So if, you know, if you're not ready, don't, don't do this, what we did, but if you are go for it, you do you. And, um, we did, we looked into adoption and doing another surrogacy journey with a different surrogate, um, at the same time, because we thought we can't do this again. Mm -hmm. If this happens again, you don't Ooh, have any more time to lose again. either at yeah. this point. Any more time. Awful. That is the worst word that anybody could tell someone that just lost somebody. It's going to take time because you don't want time. You want the baby now, um, which obviously like can't happen, but you have to kind of make them think that it's we're in the process. Um, and so Seven months after London was um, in heaven, London passed, we adopted a little baby girl mm -hmm. and her name is Bexley. And she, Bexley is a borough in London. And um, so we named her in honor of her sister. And they both have the same middle name, Quinn. Mm -hmm. And then um, seven months after we adopted Bexley, our surrogate had... Um, was pregnant and we went to the same hospital. I rang the same bell. I talked to the same doctors and the same doctor and all of the same nurses delivered our son that delivered London. And I chose to do that on purpose. I could have gone to a different hospital, a different doctor, but I wanted to conquer this pain and I wanted to face it straight on that I was going to walk out of that hospital with a baby in my arms that was breathing and alive and here on earth. And I did it and it was awful. And I walked through those doors and I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I was like, Kristen, you are going to do it. Walk through the doors, ring that bell. But my heart was like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And all of those emotions came back up into me. And I walked by that room that had the white rose and no one was occupying it because now it is used as a storage unit. And I was like, that's right. No one's going to use that room anymore. It's already been occupied. And so our son Ford was born 
And so now we have all of our kids are seven months apart. <laughs> and um, it's all of the greatest craziness in the world. I cannot imagine my life without these two that I have here. And to know that London is the reason that I have these two babies is incredible. I love them so much. And they speak about London and they they know that they're that she is their sister and that she lives in heaven and that yes they are just two years old but they know all about her because we speak her in our house and i think that is so important for others to know that it's don't put it up in a shelf and say this didn't happen i can't bring it speak it speak life into your child that it your child is here london is here right now london is very present every day and that's because i let her in i let london speak to me and i feel like a lot of women shame that and don't celebrate the loss of their child no matter what age six weeks 24 weeks 39 weeks for celebrate your child because they are a child and they are yours and they deserve the same amount of energy as your babies here on earth. And I think that is so important to, to remember. Thank you so much for sharing all at seven months apart. All of them is just so amazing too, which is there's so many, there's so many little, little signs and signals that that seven, seven, seven. I know it's just, it's, it, it's really, it's really beautiful. I can't believe like, I think, um, I, I shaved my legs today and now they're hairy again. Cause you know, yeah. they're all, like, all the goosebumps all prickly. <sighs> so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think as an agency, um, I hope that we never have to encounter something like this, but I'm so grateful that we'll be prepared with a resource that you have immediately because those early days, those early hours, I think are so critical, especially when you're and dealing with somebody who is feeling such a state of grief that they are wanting to throw out their own life because they can't have this unbearable yeah. pain and to have something to put in their hands in those hours is so valuable. So thank you so much for using what you've been through to create something that can help other people, just like whoever it was that, that came up with that bear to give to you like that. I know. And do you know that they have reached out to me since they found me on social media and reached out and were like, we are the ones that have given you the bear. I immediately broke down into wow. tears. I was like, you have no idea what that stupid build a bear has done in my life. Yeah. Like build a bear, like who would have thought that that Build-A-Bear is my life. Like that's all I have for London. And that little bear has changed my life. I was like losing my mind. And then I also wanted to bring up something else yes, if that's please, okay. Please, please. Um, listeners that may not be have maybe they don't have children um, or want children, or maybe they're done having children, or maybe they're just friends with someone that has gone through loss. So if you know someone that has gone through loss and you're like, what do I do? What do I say? Because that was a huge part in our healing. Our neighbors would run inside like, like we had like some fungus growing out of it. They just didn't want to face us. We would get the complete ignore aspect of it where I would, it was our vet. We would like drop off our dog. And like, this was maybe two or three weeks after it had happened and there was no mention of it. So people just don't know how to handle loss. Don't send flowers. Flowers die and you just dealt with death, nor do you have the energy to keep the flowers alive. Um, I remember walking out of my room and 
every time I walked out of my room, it just looked more and more like a, a cemetery. It was like white flowers everywhere. And I just didn't want to be reminded of the loss yet. I just wasn't ready. And so I remember my mom walked out. Um, she's like, Kristen, I know what you're going through. Like, I get it, but there's something different today. Like, what is it? And I was like, I hate these flowers. I hate them. I was like, we need to get rid of all of them. But there was one grouping of flowers that was colorful. All the rest of them were white. So we got rid of all the white flowers and we kept the one colorful because that gave me energy, that gave me life. And in that moment, that's all I needed was life. So if you're going through it, a simple, I'm sorry, let me know when you're ready and I'm here for you. That's all you need. You don't have to send anything. You don't have to try and figure out the right words because we don't, we don't want to, there's nothing you can say that is going to change the way I feel. And so a simple, I'm sorry, I'm here for you. End of the story. You don't have to keep going on. You don't have. And I think that people just don't know what to do. And so to hear that from someone that has gone through loss, I think is very, a very valuable point. Um, and so hopefully if you do have to face someone that has gone through loss, you can take that with you and, and be there for them and know that you don't have to go over and beyond for, you know, the unbearable thing is the un unthinkable. Can you hug, you can know? you hug them? <laughs> you can hug them. Okay. You can hug them. You can write. I loved handwritten letters. I loved anything that was very personable, like something, even if it was as simple as London was so beautiful. Like, I can't imagine that you're going to have to go through this, but I am here for you, blah, blah, blah. It was just, it almost was like the commercialized aspect of like, what happens when somebody dies? We send flowers. Where that's all we kind of know as a society is like how to, to do that. But I think it's maybe acceptable for like a grandpa or a grandma that's passing away to send white flowers. But there's something about white flowers with a baby that just doesn't seem right to me. I don't know. It just seems very cold and empty. And that's not what I wanted to feel. But a hug, love hugs. Mm, good. Hugs are great. They may last five seconds and they may last 15 minutes, depending on where you are in your grieving. Yeah. Some days I'm really good and other days it's really hard. Yeah. And I think I'm okay. And then I'll go through a day where I'm like, wow, it's emotional today. It's a heavy day. And that's okay because your life after loss has changed forever. My life will never be the same. And you have to be okay with that. You have to know that you are stronger than you ever will be because of this situation. And you are going to help others by speaking on your loss. Yeah. If I was to be so closed off and never speak of my loss of London, the amount of people that we have helped today to think of that is crazy. So just to even say like, oh, we lost our daughter at 15 weeks and I guarantee you they were going to say, oh my gosh, we lost, we knew of somebody or we had this and what did you do? Or how, there's the ways that you can connect and heal and grow with the community over loss, especially infant loss is so needed because women are scared. Women are embarrassed like I was to speak on loss. And I think we just need to be more open and know that, it happens and it's okay. Um, and it's part of life, unfortunately. I never would have pictured me sitting here today talking about infant loss ever. I thought I was going to be 
like everyone else and just have a normal pregnancy. And here I am not, I wasn't pregnant. I didn't have my first child and it took 14 years. So don't give you know, up. It's yeah. Don't give up. Yeah. Oh, never. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you have to keep going. Yeah. I have so many things that I'm thinking that we could be doing to spread the word and make sure that every agency on this planet knows about this process and this being an option for them. So how do we, how do we get involved? Yeah, how do we support this, like, this mission? Screaming from the rooftops. <laughs> screaming, right. And you know, what's interesting is I spoke at uh, the seeds convention um, in Orlando mm -hmm. and there was agencies and uh, law firms and everything associated with surrogates and every single agency was like, we need this. This is what we need. This is what we're missing. Yeah. Like we don't have any way, like obviously loss happens, but we don't even know what to do when it happens. Like, where do we go? And to know that, like, to have the comfort to say, we have something for you and it is right here and you are going to get the help you need right now. Yeah. Um, I, it's word of mouth. And that has been what you ladies are doing with the podcast and spreading the word and getting it out there that there is a resource. I, my goal for London is the reason is to get these boxes into every single hospital and agency in the world yeah. so that, and I hope they collect dust. I hope they sit there and are never used. I unfortunately had to send five boxes to an agency just last week. Five. To one agency? to one agency. So it's happening more and more and more. And I think the more that surrog surrogacy becomes more known, yeah, a resource the more losses are. that we're gonna yeah. have. Yeah. Because when I went through surrogacy, I didn't even know what it was. I literally was like, what is this? Someone else can hold your baby? That is like incredible. Now I feel like it's second nature. They're like, oh, seriously? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not prepared for what might. Mm -hmm. We're just prepared. Like I said, you just think it's a, a done deal. You just think that you're paying for a product. It's a business transaction. And here you go. Here's your baby. Yeah. You know, and we're talking 39 weeks to the minute and it happened. So I think parents and intended parents are okay with knowing maybe that this could happen early on six, seven, eight weeks, because they know that that's more common, but the more common is becoming a little mm -hmm. bit later, unfortunately. Uh, and a lot of doctors just don't know why. Um, and that's, that's yeah. kind of yeah. an issue. Yeah. Anyways, um, and everybody that I talk to has a new story, which I think in itself is very helpful to know that like, it's not just one common thing that's leading up, but then it's also like, okay, yeah, but how so do we stop so this? Many, yeah. Like things that you could step on that, that this could happen to you in so many myriad ways. And it's not like you can solve this one problem and then prevent it. It's, it's a slew of, and, and there's the unknowns. And I think that's really just the, the part that's hard wrapping your mind around. You don't know. Yeah. You just don't know. Yeah. I love that. I love that. There's so much, there's so much value in that. Thank you so much. Thank you for creating this. Thank you for channeling your grief into something that is going to impact so many lives for, you know, how, how, forever, forever and to come. Forever. So thank you for that. 
course. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I am always so grateful when people want to hear my story and hear London's story and know that we're out here and we're here to help and to make a change. So it's people like you that take the time that are going to help others. So thank you. Thank you for doing us the honor.